My name is Liz Reitzig and I'm mom to five amazing children. And we depend on farmers to provide us with the raw milk that we all drink. The Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, they protect our farmers by helping to keep them out of jail in this hostile climate towards raw milk. Many farmers are criminalized merely for feeding their communities and providing them the foods they need. This is why I support the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, because they are there. They have our farmers' backs. They keep the supply chain open for the families like mine who need this. And that's why I'm asking you to support them today as well. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT No-Gov License. This allows for use uh, for anybody except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more <laughs> about that at BIPCOT.org. Uh, so today we have John Moody, who is an activist uh, for food freedom, he's the executive director for the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, and he's a f small farmer in Kentucky. And we're going to be discussing his, um, you know, the his organization. For, is, uh, the website is called farmtoconsumer.org, and and you can find him on uh, Facebook under John Moody, M O O D Y, as well as the uh, Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund uh, as a Facebook page and YouTube channel and Twitter. So check them out. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the history of food regulation and food freedom, uh, as well as, um, you know, he mentioned when the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund just. Uh, started, how it it worked a lot on um, helping to reduce farmer raids by um, you know uh, fascist agents of the state, usually the FDA or maybe USDA or other types of alphabet soup agencies like that, um, and also maybe the uh, the history of the Wholesome Meat Act and how that has changed uh, the meat industry uh, uh, to date. So um, so John, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. No problem. I uh, I heard you first on the Tom Woods show, and I th thought that was a really awesome conversation. I'm like, God damn it, I got to get this guy on my show. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no problem. So so please, um, yeah, t let 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 us know like um, a little bit about I guess the background of the of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, and then uh, and then go into you know how how food. I mean, I, mean, I remember you mentioned to me how you said food. Um, in general, I guess dairy and meat and all these other, uh, all these other uh, uh, various um, you know areas are one, some of the most regulated in all of our you know society. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, explain that to people a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, I think most people don't realize people complain about light bulb laws and people complain about e-cigarette laws or this or that. And then they, they go, you know, get food at a drive through or they go to a grocery store and they, they, they're like, oh, but I have all this freedom and choice in what I eat, which is totally not true. More than our homes, more than our cars, more than our education. I'd submit to people the most regulated and meddled with part of our lives is the food we eat and who we get it from. Um, and, and it's amazing when you begin to see how bad that's been for everybody involved in the system except for you know, a, a few well-placed people who make a lot of money through this. Um, and especially though how bad it is for average farmers and how bad it is for eaters, um, you know, the people who get to enjoy all of these pseudo foods that no longer have nutritional value and the other problems they contain yeah 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I remember you telling me that um, uh, I think it was uh, Jeffrey Tucker who uh, you know was talking about McDonald's food and how this is a you know the, the wondrous um, um, you know treasure of capitalism. Uh, and uh, <laughs> not really taking into account how uh, how subsidized food, fast food industries like McDonald's are, and you know it's it's kind of irritating to me, like to consider like how would food actually look like if it did not have you know the perverse incentives imposed on it by the state, right? You know how would it how would it have developed? We have no idea. You know, like so many areas in society, we have no idea how cars would have developed with all all these regulations without food. How would food have developed? <laughs> You know? Yeah. Well, I think the sad part is we have little glimpses of what food would have been like, and it would have been amazing. The you know we we would get Tucker's gastric delights, <laughs> these marvelously you know like I have an apple orchard a couple hours north of us that supplies apples to our buying club. They have. 30 varieties of apples. Hmm. Wow. Well, growing up, I thought there was one. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, the red delicious. I don't right. know why it's called delicious. It's more like the red douchebag. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, like they, they, have, they have an apple that is a rust brown color hmm. that is – is like you know, it's called a golden russet apple. It almost looks like a potato that grows on a tree. Wow! <laughs> and and it's it, you know like how do we get you know like have you ever seen rainbow carrots? Um, or like have you ever seen purple potatoes? Mm. So so like right. we have a foretaste of what a a free market food system would look like, but it's constantly suppressed. And hampered and hindered at every turn and in every way by the government, you know, by the government cartels that are acting at the behalf of the food, food behemoth, mm -hmm. you know, bad guys. So, so you know, if, if you were to tell that to somebody and they would say, okay, so it's controlled and it's suppressed all these different varieties, but why? What's the motive? Like, how does that benefit, you know, the corporations to have? only a couple of varieties of apples and a couple of varieties of corn, you know, let's say. Ah, well, for corporations, um, there's a really, there's a really good book um, your readers can grab called Stuffed and Starved hmm. by a guy by the name of Ra Patel. And um, if we're, if I were to put an hourglass shape up here, um, the top would represent people who produce food, farmers. Mm -hmm. There's millions of them at the top of the hourglass. At the bottom of the hourglass, there's eaters. There's hundreds of millions of us. But what happens at the center of that hourglass? Bottleneck. There's a bottleneck. And, what, and, and farmers in, in, in all sorts of areas and all sorts of industries, they cannot get food to consumers – without going through the corporate mm -hmm. control matrix at the center of the bottleneck mm -hmm. that's established by regulation and other factors. Mm -hmm. So and the, the those, you know, those food processors, food distributors who are a tiny fraction of the total number of people involved in food exert enormous control over what is raised how it's raised, and one thing I think most people don't realize, um, farmers are one of the few industries that has no ability to set what they get paid for their products. Hmm. So, so imagine, you know, if, if you're a beef farmer, you don't get to decide what you get paid for your beef. If you're a dairy farmer, you don't get to decide what you're paid for your dairy products. If you're an apple orchard farmer, you don't get to decide what you get paid per bushel of apples. Hmm. You, 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 are, you are left with no choice but to take whatever is offered you no matter how grossly unfair. Hmm. Um, to, to, to expose myself to this experience, 
Um, you know, we have a 35 acre farm and we've raised out some beef cattle over the past few years. I decided to take just a couple of them to the local auction. Um, so the beef auction. Mm -hmm. um, so the majority of beef eaten in America that it starts out on farms like mine, but the cows at some age will go to the auction house and they'll be auctioned mm -hmm. to larger beef companies who will then transport the beef, you know, like they go into the commodity beef chain. Hmm. Um, and I, and I wanted to, I, I wanted to experience what it was like for my neighbors who have been getting to know for many years. And, and I see their economic turmoil and I, and I, I hear their complaints, but I really wanted to understand. And you go to this auction house and there's one person buying beef and bidding on them. There's no market. There's really? no competition. Wow. Yeah. Like, and there used to be two, but the one guy quit showing up because he said, we're both on the same page anyway. It's just for show that I'm here. <laughs> so, like, you take this one, I'll take the one down the road. Um, and, and, and that's what farmers face. That's why pasteurized, cruelty based CAFO milk can go on sale for $1.99 a gallon at Kroger or Walmart or somewhere because that farmer, um, you, you know, you, you are literally breaking his family when you buy that milk. Hmm. Um, the average dairy farmer loses money with every gallon they milk. Hmm. Um, th this year, grain, grain commodity prices are so low that farmers will be planting grain that they know they're going to lose money on. Therefore, get this. This is great. There's a great article recently on this in the mainstream news. Therefore, a lot of them are planting extra. So uh, imagine being in an industry where you know you're going to lose money doing something. So you decide to do more of that mm. to increase your loss mm -hmm. <laughs> because the government is going to step in and bail them out. Wow. <laughs> because of the farm bill. So so this is, I assume you're talking about the, the big factory farms. Wait, well, which, these which... are grain and commodity farmers. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but, you know, but these artificially low grain prices, yeah. which happen because the government has, um, you know, totally corrupted and perversified um, grain growing in our nation. Um, who benefits from artificially cheap grain? Well, I don't. Yeah. But people who are confinement raising animals benefit, you know, gads. Like mm -hmm. like you know, mm -hmm. why is a chicken why can you buy a whole chicken on sale at a grocery store for ninety nine cents a pound? When I cannot raise a whole chicken for you on my farm for probably less than three to four dollars a pound. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, what's driving that disparity? Yeah. It, it's because my competition is so heavily subsidized and protected mm. and propped up. Yeah, it reminds me of um I think you know when FDR came to power <laughs> during the great, great great depression after the crash of 29 and one of the policies he instituted, I forget the name of it, but he basically they basically sent agents uh, to like slaughter massive amounts of pigs and like dump milk and I forget what's what's what would the, you know the act was called, but that was like in a, in a, in an effort to you know somehow manipulate the prices of these of these goods and in a time when people were there's mass starvation, <laughs> and then and so, and so they, then I think since then they started paying farmers not to grow certain things and and I assume that that's still around today. Well, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, like. In a number of states, farmers are not allowed to choose how much they grow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so take raisins. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Supreme Court finally sided with raisin growers. Um, and basically, in California and other states, this raisin board told you how much you could grow raisin wise 
Mm-hmm. And if you grew over it, they could seize your raisins and throw them away. Hmm. Really? <laughs> um, and, and, and this is true. You know, like there's – there's these quotas and regulatory systems in place, many of them that date back to World War II and other absolutely egregious things that took place during that period of time in terms of freedom, free association, private property that, that are still not only on the books but being used mm. to, to basically tell farmers – um, you know, you can grow this and not that. You can grow this much, not that much. And if you go over, we'll just take it and throw it away so it doesn't enter the market. Oh. <laughs> it just hurts hurts my heart when I hear things like that. Like, man, <laughs> you know, this is a this is a government that everybody supports and loves and thinks protects them and provides security and roads and, <laughs> and it's Destroying. Roads with large potholes that yeah. give me flat tires, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, and it does, yeah. It's like it's like you know, it's, it, in so many facets of life, you know, we can demonstrate that the state is an agency of inefficiency and wastefulness, complete rampant wastefulness, not, not only destroying productivity and destroying creativity and potential but just completely wasteful and just like you said like like you know destroy <laughs> and, and and you know we were talking earlier about the uh the raids with the um with the raw uh dairy farmers and how you know yeah. i've seen videos oh my god it's so painful these people they go over there and they say where's your milk where's your cheese and they just <laughs> force them gallons and gallons of milk they just force them to just dump it oh and then and then the people who work in the farms they, they're trying to talk to these people like how can you sleep at night? How can you live with yourself yeah. doing this kind of job? Ugh. Well, you know, it. There, there's two stories your listeners would probably appreciate. One is the story of Vernon Hirschberger. Um, he was a farm-to-consumer member in the state of Wisconsin. And the, the state of Wisconsin has basically like a moo mafia. Hmm. So it's like a dairy cartel, the moo mafia. I just got that. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> and um, and so the Moo Mafia, it, um, Vernon started a private buying club where he was just peacefully, voluntarily feeding his community. Total transparency. Nobody's forced to shop there. You know, like, and he was just peacefully feeding his community um, people who wanted food directly from his farm. And, um, the DACTAP, the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection in Wisconsin, you know, this is a guy who has 10 children and not as much as a parking ticket. Hmm. And he was drug into a multi-year, multi-million dollar court battle Hmm. that we ended up litigating. Um, At one point, an agent of the DACTAP in Wisconsin, showed up at his farm and poured dye in his, like, I think it's a thousand gallon oh. bulk milk tank, oh my destroying God. a thousand gallons of pristine organic milk. Wow. In a state that has, you know, tens of thousands of starving people. Right. Um, we ended up winning that case, e- even though the judge played. The judge and the state played every dirty trick you could possibly imagine in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. Um, we won the case, um, and at some point after the case, the same woman who had poured the dye mm-hmm. in Vernon's bulk tank, she came up to Vernon crying. And Vernon has been one of the most – gentle-hearted, forgiving people you will ever meet, especially mm. after what the state had done to him. Yeah. And and this woman walks up to him crying, you know, saying, like, what I did was so wrong. So so some of them, you know, like, mm. it's just to encourage people, um, I, I'm very open in my views. You have no right to tell me what I eat and feed my family. Right. And if you destroy my food, what you are doing is a great moral evil. But if we continue to treat these people with compassion and love as we are driving home the evil and wickedness of what we're doing, what they're doing, we can win some of them back. 
um, mm-hmm. and, and really begin to break down um, some of the opposition there mm-hmm. in a way that you'll never do if you, you know, if, if you if you respond to their dirty tactics in kind. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, so there's the Vernon Hersberger case, which, il- you know, illustrates large amounts of food being just needlessly, wantonly destroyed for no reason. Mm. Uh, but then the uh, another one that comes to mind is Laura Bloodsoe. Um, if you Google farm to fork fiasco, hmm. it'll bring up the story on our website. But Laura and her family are organic farmers in Nevada, and they were doing a farm to fork dinner on their farm. Um, so just a beautiful all stuff from their farm dinner. In I think it was in the fall, so just beautiful weather. Hmm. Five star chef came. And wow. um, a, a local health department official showed up and forced them to pour bleach on all of the food. They, the, the health official would not even let them feed the food to their pigs and other <laughs> animals. Um, uh, and it's 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 wow. it's appalling. It, it's wow. one of the reasons I it's one of the reasons I am so for eliminating um, immunity and impunity for government officials. Because mm-hmm. the problem is right now a government official does wrong mm-hmm. and there's generally little to no consequence. And if there is, it's borne by the taxpayer. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so and and I'm just like, that's not um, that that's just not acceptable that these people can can be in positions to do such harm to other people and have no repercussions or ramifications for themselves. Yeah, 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 you know, you're so right when you say um, that even if you do enter into a legal battle with them and you win and you get paid, that money is taxpayer money. So it's like it's like it's not even their money. So it's uh, it, there's really no way to win. And and the way you the way you say you know eliminating this immunity, this sovereign immunity, um, <clears throat> you know, to me is what separates a private business from from the state. Right, mm-hmm. because every private business has to claim responsibility and accountability for their product. Right, you can't you can't just say I'm just doing my job. I'm you know <laughs> you can't yeah. you can't blame me for my milk. You know, <laughs> of course you can. So this is this is essentially what separates the two, and uh, and you know what separates a private security officer or 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 um, you know a bodyguard or a bouncer from a from a law enforcement officer right it's, it's, it's the the um the assumption of uh, of responsibility so that's uh, that's some amazing stories uh, yeah it's just uh, it's just yeah i mean i mean i've i've um i've heard a lot about um uh, monsanto's stories like like when um you know monsanto trucks would be um Oh no, no, sorry. Um, wait, how did it work? Yeah, Monsanto trucks, and then and then the wind blows like the seeds off of their trucks, and it and it <laughs> and it and it you know it starts growing on another person's farm, and then Monsanto sues them for like was it like infringing on their copyright, something like that. And yeah, that, <laughs> right. So many times that has happened and destroyed you know family farms that have been in business for decades, um, because you know even if they do win. You know, that's still like, um, you know, getting into massive amount of debt, just trying to prove yourself innocent. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why our organization started is, you know, farmers like Vernon, Mm. he would not have been able to defend himself. Right. And so when we take a case on behalf of a member, generally they end up paying nothing. We pick up the entire bill. Wow. But we're only able to do that because we're a membership organization. Mm. And we have thousands of members like you who all chip in 50 or 100 bucks a year. Mm. And that makes us able to take these cases. And, and we also have attorneys who work at like one-fifth the normal rate that they could be making elsewhere. Mm. Um, wow. and, and, and so we, we have very gracious attorneys who are committed to protecting small farmers. Mm. And, and we have members hopefully like you and your listeners who will join – who care deeply about you know the fact that um, well, well you know th- this is this is what really gets my goat. This is what a few years ago we um, sued the FDA hmm. um, over their interstate ban on raw milk. Oh yeah, okay. and in response to the, to our lawsuit, 
the FDA said in writing, and I'll send you the link, but they said in writing that there is no fundamental right to choose what you eat and feed your family. Really? There is no fundamental right to choose the foods you want from who you want. There is no fundamental right to your own physical well-being and bodily health. Wow. <laughs> and and wow. so the people who join our organization, they hear that and they chafe under it and they want to see somebody stand up to the FDA and say, "Oh no, big guy, you're wrong." <laughs> Yeah. And we're gonna we're, and we're gonna go toe to toe with you, at every turn, you know we're gonna fight for every inch of ground on this issue. Wow. Because because like for me, um, you know there's certain lines in the sand, and one of them is what I eat. Right. <laughs> um, like I am going to choose what I eat. So and who I get it from. Yeah, yeah. Like the one of the uh, the, the core concepts of. Uh of altruism is self ownership and it's a very simple concept you know you own yourself and your actions and you're responsible for whatever actions you 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 take and the consequences that result and uh, and most people accept that yeah i own myself yeah right okay all right so what if you want to do marijuana in your basement can you do that <laughs> what if you want to drink raw milk can you do that you know what if whatever you know um and and uh, and it gets muddled you know people invent all these little um justifications for why you can't you know oh no the marijuana you know it makes you a danger to society oh no raw dairy maybe if you're sick you can get somebody else sick you're danger <laughs> whatever <laughs> ridiculousness yeah. they can think of but but in the end it's like who owns you if you don't own your own body then who does the politicians mm -hmm. the state owns you <laughs> and, yeah well and and i you know like i'm i'm a libertarian in my you know personally politically um I'm libertarian. I'm just like I have a hard enough time running my own life. <laughs> exactly. Like how how would I ever get the credentials to run other people's lives? You know, J.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, right. um, he he was basically an anarchist. Right. The older he got, he has a great quote where he basically says, you know, like you know, telling people how to live, live their lives is a job not one man in a million is fit for. Oh yeah. You know, it's just. Um, so, but even more so, um, when people try and use these risk arguments, like raw milk is risky. Right. <laughs> raw milk hasn't killed somebody in 30 years, whereas <laughs> bluebell pasteurized ice cream took out what, like half a dozen last summer? <laughs> or, or how many times do, do they recall like, like thousands of pounds of beef for like, uh, you know, reported forty-seven this. million pound recall was issued in the past two weeks. Oh, what was that? a forty-seven that, uh, million pound recall. Is that like salmonella thing or a scare I, I forget or something? what they found. God, I, I, you know, but but this is the other part too. Like you know, when it comes to food safety, yeah. Um, if if our concern is truly safe food, um, because you know, I'm willing to I, I'm willing to contest and argue all facets of this subject. Right. And I just point out like in a local food system, you're never going to have a 47 million pound recall. You're never <laughs> going to have a 4 million 700,000 pound recall. You're never going to have a 470,000 pound recall. You're never going to have a 47,000 pound recall. Yeah. You're never going to have a recall affecting 15 states over 6 months and 3,000 products. Uh. Because it's a it's a system by nature that that it, it, you know it's inherently built on traceability, accountability, and transparency. Mm -hmm. You know when you get um, it, it's like with the beef from my farm. Um, you know I have a freezer full of beef under the side of our house here, and it's labeled not for sale. I know exactly where that cow came from before it came to my farm. I know exactly how that cow was raised on my farm. I know exactly what butcher that cow was butchered at when it left my farm. I went back to the butcher and picked it up myself, and that cow is not safe for me to sell a single package of meat to you from. But you can go to McDonald's, and you can get a meat-like product on a bun 
that is the molecules of 1.3 million cows and other substances ground together. Oh, and yeah. that's safe. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, yeah, you're like you said, thousands of cows ground all together. And like, what if, you know, some feces gets in there and it's ground all. How do you even like, how do you yeah, even like keep track of that? Yeah, <laughs> right. well, and, and they can't, you know, and so um, they, they basically, what kills me with consumers is consumers go to the grocery store and, and consumers basically trust shiny labels and government stamps mm-hmm. as if somehow pathogens care about either. <laughs> right. Well, and, and what, you know, go, um, consumer reports a number of years ago did a phenomenal study where they pulled chicken from grocery stores across the nation and tested it for pathogen contamination. So this is your FDA approved, USDA stamped and sealed, triple chlorine bathed, <laughs> CAFO crap chicken. Ch- Chinese, and, ch- Chinese chicken. <laughs> well, th- well, not Chinese yet. Oh, that's not Chinese yet. Okay, Maybe soon. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so, so this is, you know, th- th- this is the mecca, the pinnacle of government food. And what Consumer Reports found was that three quarters of the chicken samples tested positive for pathogenic bacteria. Hmm. Pathogenic meaning bacteria that cause illness. Yeah. And half of those strains were antibiotic resistant. Man. And most of the chickens contained at a minimum three different strains. Yeah. And, and that chicken's been washed and sanitized <laughs> and professionally packaged and multiple time government inspected. <laughs> and it's in a government, you know, like it's, it's lived in a government inspected facility its whole life. And for you and I, we'd say if I, li- you know, like, of course it's going to be sick. It's lived in a government inspected facility its whole life. <laughs> you know, like nothing can be healthy that lives under the thumb of the government its entire <laughs> existence. Right. But consumers, consumers look at it and consumers are like, this is, you know, this is safe, but unpasteurized milk from my neighbor's cow is like Russian roulette and going to kill me. <laughs> um, and, and it's, it, it's baffling the disconnect in the general public. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talking about government labels, can you go into a little bit of the, um, you know, the politics about the organic label and, and how that's changed over the years? Ooh. <laughs> um, so organic labeling, well, you know, organic labeling, um, one of my good friends who no longer lives in Kentucky, he actually worked inside of the National Organic Program, the NOP. So the, the National Organic Program is part of the USDA. Um, and it was founded, I believe, I guess probably in the late 1990s to regulate the burgeoning organic industry. Um which I personally would say has been an utter disaster for the organic movement because it basically led to it being industrialized and taken over by corporate interests who have no interest and no care about integrity farming. Mm -hmm. Um, So originally when when the National Organic Program was started, they built exceptions into the law because of the lack of organic inputs for some products and some types of farms. Um, so, so these were provisions that were meant to be tightened over time hmm. as the industry grew and a farmer could no longer say, I can't get X organically. I can't buy Y organically. Or for a, you know for a company that's making breakfast cereal, um, you, you know it used to be like eighty percent of an item in a box had to be organic in order for it to be labeled certified organic. Mm-hmm. And over time, that was supposed to increase. Mm-hmm. And instead, what's happening in the National Organic Program is they're making the standards more and more lax. Mm-hmm. And less and less stringent because most of what is now being grown organically in America 
um, is basically being grown by organic industrial organic mega farms that in in practice and in other things often are not much different than the corporate owners you know it, conventional businesses so so I, I i you know when i talk to a lot of people about factory farms and uh, and then you know begin to understand how harmful and dangerous those kind of operations are um and how you know um you know the the food itself is not uh, to be trusted so then they say well what should i do so now i should all organic and 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 i guess they you know they 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 see this so uh, there are only two choices right you know the factory farm or the organic so what would you say to those people um <clears throat> what, what would you be your recommendation well you know like i get one or two items at a small local grocery store uh a week um, you, you, you as a consumer have so many options to support actual local farmers. There's CSAs, there's farmers markets, there's buying clubs. Um, for those in New York, there's like nourishing Long Island and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, I know this. You know, they, there are there are so many ways to opt out of the government food system. Um, and, and into a system that is voluntary, integrity-based, non-cruelty-based, that th there's no reason not to um, other than some people just don't like the change mm. or they don't want to give up their Cheerios. <laughs> so, Right. Yeah, I, um, I love farmer's markets. I go to them as often as I can, and that's one of the reasons I love over here, spring, and summer, and fall so beautiful you know just not only meeting the farmers and I, actually that's what i love i love meeting the farmers and they just ask them all kinds of questions and and you know they they love what they do and they have pride in their produce and it's just a beautiful thing you know to talk directly to the farmers like how many people when you go to you know like walmart or shopper or you know king cullen or a big big chain like that how many people can talk to the owners <laughs> of the farms yeah. that they buy from you know yeah, well, and and you know, even worse, it's just like when you shop at those other places, the farmers get so little of what you. See. The farmer who raised that food gets less than twenty cents of your dollar. Hmm. Wow. That's, and and that's so, much. um, you know, one thing that we're going to see how it plays out demographically, but farmers are a dying occupation. The average age of a farmer in America, I believe, is well above 60. Hmm. And economically speaking, any industry whose average employee is above – average employee age is above 45 is considered an industry in decline. Once you get above you know, like the 50s for average age of employees, you're talking about an industry that is in – you know, it, it's in demolition. It's hmm. and farmers. You know, like most of my neighbors who farm, I, I mean, you know, a, a lot of them. So, some of them were almost born in the previous century. <laughs> um, you know, a, yeah. a lot of my neighbors are, are so old. If they stand still in a forest, you can't tell them apart from a tree. <laughs> um, you know, like, like and and not a lot of pe people want to go into farming. Because you know it is it is very hard physical work. Yeah, um, it is incredibly challenging work. You know, we had passed through Kentucky this spring four different times. Our farm was threatened by tornado or hail. Hmm. If hail, or if heavy hail or tornadoes had hit our farm in twenty minutes, they would have done ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of damage. Right. Yeah. Um. You, you know, like, I, I mean, hmm. it, it's it, it is, and 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 I don't get to set my, you know, and like for a lot of farmers, they don't get to set their prices. Yeah. And so you you have just like who wants to do this job? Mm -hmm. Um. And, and unless average people decide that they want farmers to have freedom and they want farmers to still be there raising food for their children. They don't want their children merely drinking solient green. Um, <laughs> you, you know, like you know, people have to continue to drive the change we're seeing. Mm -hmm. But for volunteerists and anarchists, 
it, it's a change towards the type of society we we long for. Hmm. You know, one based around voluntary exchange, transparency, hmm. integrity. So, so instead of manipulation and coercion. So you're saying that 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 farming is. Um is slowly um, disappearing because of the age, not because of machines replacing the need for farmers. Well, I mean, there's a huge need for farmers. And like, I, you know, I might get in trouble saying this, but I'm on a show that, you know, the people who hear it won't probably care. <laughs> but um, if the way a person interacts with their land is through a very large machine, in my view, they're no longer a farmer. They're a heavy equipment operator mm. who owns land. Mm. Like to actually farm, um, and, and and you know you'll you'll notice that. And this isn't to say that you know like Joel Salatin uses a tractor. Um, I on occasion rent a skid steer or borrow a tractor, mm -hmm. but most of my interaction with the ecosystem that is my farm is done on my feet. Or on my knees. Hmm. Um, wow. And again, I'm not saying that there's not a place for technology in farming. Mm -hmm. And there's some technologies coming out that are fascinating in how they might help small farmers. Um, so, hmm. but, but at the end of the day, the, the real thing that makes a farmer a farmer is an actual understanding of how ecology and ecosystems work mm -hmm. in a meaningful way and expending energy to steward and tame those and bring beauty and harmony out of the excesses and challenges that, that nature creates apart from that. Hmm. And you don't do that from a tractor. Right. So All you do from a tractor is apply chemicals multiple times a year and then cut, you know, pseudo food crops. Hmm. Um, you know, you, you don't really farm that way. Hmm. So, so, so what would be, what would you say the difference is between the way you farm and the way Joel Saladin farms apart from the, uh, you know, the, the machinery? Oh, well, I mean, Joel, like, you know, um, you know, the big difference is I wish I was as great a farmer as Joel. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wish I had like a quarter of the knowledge he has. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, you know, like, you know, I, you know, I want your listeners to understand, though, like um, small farms can vary greatly in terms of methodology, design, um, mix of products and animals on their farm. And still all be ecologically faithful. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they can just be growing. Um, you know, like when we started our farm, I could not get non genetically modified animal feed mm. in the state of Kentucky. I had to go like eight hours or something to get animal feed, which was not fiscally viable. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, I would have had to have charged like twenty dollars a dozen for my eggs, mm -hmm. um, hmm. and so like you also need to, um, you know, you need to watch out for farmers who are merely being lazy. Um, but at the same time, we, you know, I, I meet city people who are so ignorant of what farming is actually like. Mm -hmm. um, I want a chicken that eats only bugs. And I'm like, well, I can't guarantee you that your chicken will eat only bugs. So you will need to find another farmer. Um, <laughs> you, you know, like, I, I want a cow that has never eaten a single seed or grain. I was like, but my pasture is full of seeds and grains and other things. And my cows eat those as they eat the grass. <laughs> um, right. you, you know, like, um, sometimes consumers come to farmers with ill informed standards mm -hmm. that, that farmers cannot meet. Um, and so, you know, like our farm is, um, especially, you know, Joel has 400 acres and he has a multi-generation head start and his farm is one of the most glorious things you'll ever see. If you and your listeners are free in August, the weekend of August 19th and 20th, he sets aside 
that Saturday as a fundraiser for our organization and does a tour. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it's a food freedom weekend. Wow. You know, down in Staunton, Virginia. <laughs> you can buy tickets on our website. <laughs> um, Polyface donates all this stuff to make it a fundraiser for us. Yeah. Um, but come on down, see me in person. A, a ton of the people who are there are, you know, freedom oriented, libertarian, you know, crazy people, including Joel. <laughs> um, and we'll, and we'll have a great time talking about these things in person. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> you know, but our farm, we're only 35 acres. We've only been here six years. Okay. Um, and so, um, and, and, you know, our farm, um, especially because our kids are so young and we're still building infrastructure, is a work in progress. And, and I, you know, Joel leans heavily towards animal agriculture, mm. um, where I'm leaning in the direction of um, permaculture and especially food forests hmm. and similar um, similar approaches, silvo pasture, food forest types approaches um, to building out our farm. Wow. Have you heard of the book um, called Cure Tooth Decay? Um, yeah, by Rami Nagel. Rami Nagel, yeah. yeah. Awesome, awesome, because that book uh, is what really got me into raw dairy and educated me about that and... Uh, and um was it uh, fermented fish uh oil huh? and um and you know bone broth soup and bone marrow and organ meats and that, <laughs> that kind of stuff and uh, and actually i started writing for rami nagel uh for a little bit and uh, and that was fun uh for his website but um <laughs> yeah yeah it was really cool so so yeah so that's how i got into raw dairy and i started getting it and the kefir and all that and and eating that and so yeah it's really really interesting and, and fascinating how you know, it's kind of like the book of, uh, that uh, Joel Saladin wrote, which is "Everything I Want to Do Is Illegal." <laughs> oh, that is <laughs> nice. See that? Um, which I did not read, but uh, it's an awesome title, and I probably should read it. Um, oh, it's I, I almost can't read it because it hits. It's like people always ask me if I've seen the latest food documentary. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I say no, and they're like, "Why?" I was like, "I know too much." <laughs> like, like there is like going deeper down the rabbit hole only leads me to bad places. Like, I got to work on solutions. Right. Um, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Then, then, um, yeah. Talking about food, yes. Yeah, so some of the things that got me into, um, so before getting into volunteerism, I was into um, nutrition and juicing and alternative cancer therapies. And you know, learning about all that stuff in high school, and um, outside of school, of course. <laughs> and then, uh, and, and then, and that's why I studied acupuncture and Chinese herbs and Eastern nutrition because of that. It kind of, it kind of led me into that. And, and Monsanto, and then, um, and and uh, it's fascinating to read because uh, at that time, uh, I was reading a lot of these um, these websites that were advocating for banning um, uh, GMOs, right? And uh, mm-hmm. and and at that time, you know. Uh, it kind of sounded like a good idea. Like, yeah, I guess that's a good idea. Banning GMOs, and then later, you know, learning about volunteerism and what the state is and how prohibition works, and you know, how actually how it doesn't work. Yeah, <laughs> more accurately put. So, so yeah. So, well, new- th- go, ahead, go ahead. You know, I think the problem with GMOs, though, from a libertarian framework, is they they are an inherent, fundamental violation of private property rights. Hmm. So, so imagine, um, imagine you and I both have car painting businesses that are side by side. Mm-hmm. We both, we both repaint cars. If I repainted a car in a way where paint blew off of my business lot <laughs> onto cars you had painted, you'd be able to sue me. Yeah. There'd be, you know, like, like, like there is no other. There is no other place in the world other than when it comes to industrial agriculture. You know, like um, if I find glyphosate in my rainwater or well water, mm. I can't sue for trespass. Hmm. I can't sue for the contamination. Mm-hmm. If if I go check my corn in a few weeks and it has, um, you know, Franken DNA from a Monsanto corn crop down the road. 
I can't get compensated for the contamination, even though it's an economic loss and a violation of my property rights. Mm. And so, you know, I'm like, I'm not a big fan of banning GMOs. Um, partly GMOs only came into existence because of the massive government subsidies yeah. that that were thrown behind them. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, like for libertarians or, or, you know, even conservative people who fundamentally believe in private property rights, let's be clear that, um, you know, these chemicals that are used in these agricultural methods and the genetic information that is being introduced into the environment, they have no way to control and in, in, with respect to other people's private property. And that's a real problem. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see that point, and um, <clears throat> and and I think somebody asked me about that too, like with um, like genetically modified fish, let's say salmon, right? That are, I guess, for the most part, grown um, in a farm. But um, but you know, then they say, well, what if that fish gets released into the wild, right, and mates, and and then it, you know produces this and just slowly just contaminates the entire ocean? What happens then? Well, I mean, the the way I look at it is. If you if you combine like a gene from a tomato and you put it into a fish <clears throat> to get some kind of characteristic that you want, um, to me, it, it doesn't seem like that will yield a, a species that will be able to propagate. It's like for me, it's like when you combine a um, um, what is, is it a horse a horse and a mule, then you get a donkey. Is that yeah right? Or a and, horse and, and a donkey, you get right. A mule. Yeah, I always get that mixed up. And 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 basically. The reason that that's not a problem is because that's an evolutionary cul-de-sac. It doesn't lead anywhere, right? Because it's sterile. Yeah. And and so th- that's the, kind of the way I'm thinking about GMOs now. It's like, sure, like you said, it, it can contaminate, but it won't go so far because, like, it just it, it can't. <laughs> it, it's not you know it's not viable as an organism. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the problem is. Um, Genetic contamination has been shown to be fairly persistent. Hmm. So it's um, like now with some areas, yes, it, it doesn't – it seems unlikely that the genetic contamination would have legs Yeah. because things are so um, – yeah, because things are the way they are. But there's other areas where um, – the genetic contamination, you know, it's something like sugar beets, mm-hmm. you know, sugar beets and, and corn in America, you know, even a lot of organic corn shows traces of genetic contamination um, from mm-hmm. genetically modified corn. Mm-hmm. Um, so so some of the genetic information seems to be rather durable, mm. um, you, you know, and then it would be interesting to see over time. Farmers are starting to plant less and less genetically modified crops in response to consumer concern and demand. Mm-hmm. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if if genetically modified crops are dramatically scaled back in the next 20 years, if some of that contamination passes away. Um, at the same time, though, it's not just genetic contamination. Um, a lot of the pesticides and herbicides they use – have half lives of five or more years, and so these are persistent. And my family's well water, mm. my great great grandchildren may still be getting exposure in the well water. Sadly, hmm. um, you know they did. Um, somebody did a study, and they basically showed that like um, glyphosate is so prevalent in the environment that. Samples of rainwater from across the entire world test positive. Hmm. Really? <laughs> wow. Because um, because you know the chem- you know the, these wow. um, the, you know they're everywhere. Like you, hmm. you know you go up to the Arctic. It's it's so sad. Like you know think of the Eskimos and some other people groups yeah. who live in like the high Arctic, mm-hmm. and they they test some of the worst in the world for really? certain chemical contaminants. Wow. Even though they live in huts of ice, mm-hmm. wow. like you know, they're not getting chemical. Like their exposure is coming from from a system that cares not for property rights. Mm-hmm. It, it cares not where the final chemical compounds end up. 
as long as it cheaply, quickly does the job along the way for them and mm-hmm. they can avoid any downstream responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Recently, um, <clears throat> Stefan Molyneux did a, a, a video, an interview with a guy who uh, wrote a book, you know, saying about basically how GMOs um, help humanity and help to feed, you know, poor countries and starving countries and, and help, you know, it's a new wave of food and, and you know, the new, next food technology. And, um, and, and it's, and it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, the way I look at it, if, if GMOs are really the next level of food and it's more efficient and would feed more people and it's more nutritious, why does it need to be propped up by the state? Right. Because only the only things that need to be propped up by the state are economically inefficient things that cannot survive on their own because they're not profitable because they don't help people. You know, the only things, you know, if if a company like Monsanto needs to bury its um, what do you you call that? The the immunity in the farm was some farmer bill. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They can't be sued. Right. For GMOs. Like like if if it doesn't hurt people, then why are you seeking immunity from the state? (laughs) from you know from being uh from harming your consumers yeah well and and you know to take up to take up that issue of um this came up years ago i debated um basically a low level gmo rep um in a debate about um you know the hit you know the importance and history and dangers of gmos and and one thing i brought up in the debate that my opponent's conceded was historically correct um if you look at agricultural yields since the 1940s um and you look at nations that adopted genetically modified technology versus nations like russia that did not nations that adopted genetically modified technology experienced no additional yield gains on a per acre basis compared to other nations that did not. What drove the increases in agricultural gains was not genetic, you know, GMO technology. It was a host of other um, technological improvements, heavy machinery improvements, mechanization, um, chemical fertilizers, chemi- you know, it, it was a host of other factors that, regardless of whether or not you did GMO, you you got the same kind of gains productivity-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it, from a from a liberty standpoint, though, what you know, the government wanted a lot of these gains because it allowed it to bully people mm-hmm. through the bag of grain, um, and, and so. And these gains came at a high cost. Again, if you read Ra Patel, Stuffed and Starved, he chronicles the Green Revolution in India and basically how now in India you have children dying on on the side of one on, on the side of a wall, and on the other side of that wall is a warehouse, a a you know, five football fields long full of rotting grain. Hmm. Wow. Um, you, you know, like it, it, you know, it, India was one of the biggest candidates for the Green Revolution. Yet it still has rampant, massive malnourishment in spite of it, because GMO technology does not help feed people. Right. Most genetically modified grains are fed to animals that are then sold to rich Western countries. And all of that grain growing displaces indigenous, affordable agricultural systems that could actually feed those people. <laughs> um, you, you know, so so the idea that GMOs and industrial agriculture, we need it to feed the world. Hmm. We need it, or we're all going to starve to death. J- j- you know, anybody who doubts that, I invite down to Kentucky. You can spend two days with me. If we starve to death as a species, it will only be because of our stupidity. It has nothing to do with the rejection or acceptance of really poorly thought out and implemented technologies. 
That kind of reminds me of like uh, the broken window fallacy applied to agriculture, <laughs> in, the, in that in that people, you know, when I when I say, well, you know, you know, because people point at like, you know, look at police officers, look at you, look at the USPS postal workers, you know, look at school teachers, see all these people having jobs, isn't that wonderful? We're having job creation, and <laughs> and and that's the scene. But what you don't see is the massive amount of of private jobs that are created at, out of true demand that are annihilated because of the force that was necessary to create those government jobs. And the same thing with agriculture, right? Like you said, you know. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, with agriculture, it's sad because there would be millions of more agricultural jobs in America if farmers were not at the mercy of their cartels to mm. set prices. Mm-hmm. You know, food food in America should be two to three times more expensive than it is. Um, but by almost any metric you use, um, and so food prices in America are artificially low. Though we pay a high price in terms of human disease, mm-hmm. we pay a high price in terms of more and more government debt uh, and other things. But but a lot of food prices in America, um, compared to what you know, for most of human history, people have spent at a minimum thirty percent of their gross income on food. Yeah. Thirty to sixty percent is is the general historical range of what people spend on food, and Americans spend eight. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you go into a little bit of um, you know the description the discrepancy of like you know you can buy like a you know a McDonald's Happy Meal or or a, or a value meal for like I don't know a couple of dollars and then you want to buy like you know broccoli or you know any kind of produce and you're spending like almost ten dollars for that yeah. right? Well, so oh yeah, so th- you know this is great. Let's you know let's let's look at a value meal and let's look at a meal from my farm. Um, so you look at a value meal. You're probably getting 20 to 30 different pesticides and herbicides <laughs> and extenders and fillers uh. in the food. A lot of those extenders and fillers are derived or made from corn, soy, and wheat, mm. which receive almost all of the government subsidies in the farm bill. So the farm bill doesn't subsidize apples. It doesn't subsidize broccoli. It doesn't subsidize lettuce. It gives billions of dollars to soy, corn, wheat, grain growers. Um, so the the cows in in that you know the meat. I hate to use the word meat. Um, I think they did some genetic testing on a McDonald's hamburger and they could find almost no genetic evidence that a cow was in there <laughs> um, b- because the hamburger, you know, it, it's it's uh, literally a bunch of fillers. Right. It's a bunch of highly processed fillers that are only cheap because of the farm bill right. and because of our endless meddling in the Middle East to control the price of oil. Hmm. Um, there, there's a beautiful article you can Google. It's called Following the Food Chain Back to Iraq. The, the oil we eat, hmm. the oil we eat following the food chain back to Iraq. And, and this, this author basically points out that like in Iowa alone, every summer, we use the equivalent of like multiple Hiroshima nuclear bombs of energy. Hmm. Growing, um, you know, border to border corn in these states, hmm. and, and that's only possible because of government subsidies and foreign policy. If if oil was not artificially cheap, um, you wouldn't be able to do this because you wouldn't be able to turn the oil into all these things that there's farmer, you know, like just all this craziness. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we look, you know, like. Um, you know, all of the processing of that hamburger, um, that cow and all the other things that got mixed in with that cow got mixed with thousands of other cows 
and it's all mixed and processed together. Um, so McDonald's probably has their processing cost for beef down below 25 cents a pound. Hmm. Oh. Whereas for me to get a beef processed, my cost is over two to three dollars a pound. Man. Well, well, and and it's not, and and it's partly because the way the USDA meat inspection system works is the butchers I take my animal to are actually inspected, hmm. whereas the the butchering facilities. Um, McDonald's t- gets their animals from are are not inspected. You know, like our one local USDA inspector butchering house, they might be able to butcher, let's say, ten cows in a given day, and they have one USDA inspector to inspect all ten of those cows, and and just totally ride their ass the entire day. And that's exactly what the inspector does. We could do a whole episode on USDA harassment of small businesses in the food industry, whereas at a mega butcher, they're butchering a 1,000 cows per hour with one inspector. Hmm. How many of those cows is the inspector looking at? Right. (laughs) But see, I have to be inspected like him if I want to sell you a pound of meat. And and so just at every turn – um, you know, the government subsidizes pseudo food mm. and it punishes me. You know, it, here in Kentucky, if I want to sell you a head of lettuce at the farmer's market, last I checked, the farmer's market manual was like 80 to 150 pages wow. to sell a head of lettuce. <laughs> oh, shoot. Um, and then I have to have farm insurance and then I might have to have farm licenses. If I'm doing, you know, like it's just um, a- a- everything, mm-hmm. all of the costs, the, the entire regulatory system means that I am pinched and pressed and oppressed at every turn while my competitors are, pr- uh, um, you know, oh, what's the word, propped up right. with my own tax money, no less. Right. <laughs> In- um, you know, so. We all pay taxes, and it goes to these people, um, who are then, you know, and that's the worst of it is to know like a portion of the money I pay in taxes goes to the people who are growing these grains that then goes to make cows one fifth the price that I could ever raise them in in the way they've been raised since the first cow ever hit the ground. Mm. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> we should definitely, I definitely want to have you back on. I think, um, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, your five, uh, your four kids and your fifth, fifth one's on the way and, uh, and your experiences with, um, with that and, uh, at home birth. And cause we have, I think we have, we have a lot of great stories to tell about that. Um, uh, but maybe we'll save that for next time. Um, give some people some uh, anticipation for that. <laughs> but I uh, really appreciate you coming on, John. Um, I don't want you to keep you too long. Uh, so, so please, before we go, um, tell people how they can reach you if they want to follow your work. Great. Well, again, we have a website, farmtoconsumer.org. We're a membership organization. Um, we don't get grants from the government. It's not like they're going to pay us to fight them. Um, so if if you find it appalling that the USDA and FDA are willing to say in writing you have no fundamental right to choose what you feed your family, I, I encourage you to come and partner with us and help me and help our organization continue to say to them that there are people in this nation who don't agree with that sentiment. Um, you can find us on Facebook. Um, you can find us on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook at John Moody. Um, I'll be speaking – Um, If I'm up for it, I'll be speaking at Paleo FX this weekend down in Austin, Texas. Hopefully um, in a couple months again, we'll be having a very, um, you know, volunteerist libertarian get together in Virginia (laughs) about these issues. We want to invite people to, you can find out details on our website soon. Um, And then hopefully I'll just be back on the show at your convenience friend and when it's good for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So before we go, I just want to ask you, um, are you familiar with Gary Knoll's work? 
Gary Knowles. Gary Knowles. Is he a farmer? No, no. He's a. Um, I guess you say he's a food activist. He's a. He he writes on many many books. Very prolific, right? He has a lot of books. Makes he's award winning documentary maker. Um, you know, a bunch of a bunch on GMOs, a bunch on vaccines, and mm-hmm. one recently that you kind of remind me of, which is called um, the FDA. FDA the the cult of the, I think it's the War on Health and the Cult of Tyranny. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so and I guess it's approaching the FDA from the medicine perspective, you know, um, yeah. as opposed to the food. But yeah, because that's what he focuses on mainly is alternative medicine, holistic medicine. He's uh-huh. wrote, wrote a bunch of books on that, and <clears throat> and and I, I've learned a lot from him, his documentaries as well as his books. So yeah, really, really awesome uh, individual. Um, yeah, have, I think I have read some of his articles and seen some clips and other stuff by him. So, but I haven't interacted with him extensively. So I'll yeah. tomorrow or the next day see what I can dig up. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, the, uh, the vaccine nation is one that it really that's the documentary. Another documentary that um, that uh, what's it called autism made in the USA, uh, uh-huh. and, and then he wrote uh, he made one on uh, GMOs. I forget what's seeds of death, something like that. Seeds of deception. Deception. Maybe that's when it. Yeah. 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 yeah maybe that's I have it. that documentary again. Like it's so hard for me at this point because. I know firsthand in my day to day work how corrupt yeah. the government is. <laughs> you don't need to be taught it anymore. <laughs> well, and I just like at times that, you know, it's not so much I'm sticking my hands in my ears to ignore it. Yeah. But it's just because, like, I can't hear anymore at the moment. I understand. Oh, um, definitely. Just, it can be overwhelming to realize just how screwed up things have gotten. Yeah. And I feel the same way. You know, in the beginning, I was learning about, you know, you learn about all the problems, how everything is. Um, you know, corrupt and perverse and messed up, and then, and then finally, I'm like, all right, I understand. <laughs> now, let's make the world a better place. Raise our kids well, you know. Um, you know, yeah. help to give people good quality food, and I'm making this podcast. You know, helping to show people how how um, how people are improving the world through their various means. You know, either through writing, blogging, you know, being author, rapping, um, and, you, <laughs> and and you doing it through uh, this consumer. Uh, this uh, website. So um, yeah, really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Really uh, had a wonderful conversation. Um, so if anyone wants to help me out, you can do so through um, Bitcoin, Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Seeds of Liberty. You can also help me out by um, using the affiliate links on each of the, uh, on my website uh, under the post. You know, you, I'm going to have um, various books uh, related to this conversation. And if you click on those, you, you can, you um, you can buy those things through uh, through Amazon, and I will get a commission at no extra cost to you. So please help me do what I love doing best, which is interviewing fascinating people like John here. And uh, and so you know, we, as we understand in economics, there's opportunity cost to everything, right? This, nothing is free. <laughs> if we're doing this, we're not doing something else, right? So that's <clears throat> so, in, and we respond to incentives, right? Monetary incentives um, are always appreciated. <clears throat> but I I make these and I put them out there for free because I want the world to be a, a more knowledgeable place right <laughs> so Indeed. so john thanks a lot i really appreciate it um so this is peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network and thus seeds of liberty.com and the conscious resistance.com wishing everyone have a wonderful day take care bye great good night friend Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.